I appreciate the presence of the Lord. Amen. I would be lost without the presence of God. I'm thankful for that kind and that gentle touch. Amen. We're excited about what the Lord is, has already done and is going to do in this house today. I know you've been standing for a little while. I'm going to ask you to remain standing, if you will. Join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And uh, for just a few minutes, I want to preach to you this morning. In uh, pastor's studies all across our nation over the last several days, pastors like myself, others that are ministering in services today, have been revisiting the importance of what this service represents to all of us. If we're not careful, and I'm just being transparent, if we are not careful, there is a, there would be a, a little bit of a bent to try to put a new angle on this age-old, timeless message. But the truth of the matter is, is there is nothing more important and nothing more powerful than the resurrection. And so if the Lord would need me or someone else to try to put a spin on this message to make it worth more or increase in value, then we would all be in trouble. We would all be in trouble. And so for some, today you're going to hear a message or at least scriptures that you have heard many, many times. The subject matter, of course, the heart of the matter will be the same. But I have prayed and asked the Lord for a fresh anointing. Amen. A fresh touch to a timeless truth. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 1. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it was began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. <laughs> Amen. Well, we could just stop right there and... Dismiss and go home, couldn't we? Oh, but you would feel so cheated if I were to do that. Amen. So let's keep continue to reading. The Bible says, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. They were commissioned. They were commissioned. He is not here, he is risen, but the angel said, come see this, and now you have a job. You come see this, and now go tell it. Amen. You go tell it, you go tell it wherever you go. And today, that message and commission has not changed. And so this morning, under the commission of the Lord, I'm going to tell it one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has risen. He has risen. I'm going to tell it one more time. My subject this morning is simply this, the tomb says it all. The tomb says it all. And you can be seated. God bless you. Countless times I have stood behind this pulpit and said that if it were not for the resurrection, the truth of Christ's birth would simply and utterly be meaningless. It would just be another historical event that would only have weight and or value to those that were in that moment and in that day. However, Jesus Christ had to live, be born. He had to live, die, and be resurrected for this story to have meaning, any meaning whatsoever. But I can assure you today that the empty tomb in Christianity assures us that we can trust God's word, and we can trust his plan. Now I understand that it's easy to trust the word of God. And the plan of God when his word makes sense and his plan makes sense. And we can lift our hands and those hallelujahs and those amens. They just flow so freely. And 
but when his word doesn't make sense. And when you can't pull his plan into focus, those are the times that we've got to learn how to trust his word. He said he would and he will. Amen. The empty tomb assures us that we can trust him. Easter is one of those rare times that we celebrate something that's empty. Because normally we like things that are full. Can I get a witness in the house? I mean, there is nothing like going to the milk jug when you've already decided just what brand of cereal you want to have. And someone left you just enough to make you mad. I'm not suggesting that happens in households everywhere, but sure seemed like a pretty strong witness in this house to me. Nothing can be more frustrating than needing to go somewhere and you jump in your automobile only to see that little gas light, fuel light on because somebody was trying to test the limits of the designer. <laughs> Nothing can be more frustrating and disappointing than empty wallets and empty bank accounts. We don't really celebrate empty things that often. But we are happy about an empty tomb because that empty tomb didn't just mean a little, it meant everything. And so I'm just going to have to say it over and over and over again today. The empty tomb or the tomb says it all. It speaks for itself. Amen. Easter has value because our lives have value. And, and because that tomb is empty, we are able to celebrate something very significant in this house today. All you would, do, all you would have to do is just ask Mary Magdalene and ask her friend that... Matthew just refers to as the other Mary, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. They came early that morning and their hearts were heavy. Their hearts were heavy because of the preceding days. The man that they thought was the Messiah had died on a cross three days before and they had hinged their lives on the hope that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was the answer if I could just say that he was the hope of the world and the hope of eternity, the hope for the future. That was until the Roman guards had a mock trial or the Romans had a mock trial and the guards hung him on a cross. But on this morning, these ladies were up before the sun and they made their way to the tomb. They were going there simply to anoint his body with spices. They knew that they did not within themselves have the power to bring him back to life. They knew that they couldn't raise him from the dead. But they were willing to do what they felt like they could do. What they could do was just to stave off the stench of death for a few more days. And so within their power, what they could do, they said, we will do. And they came early that morning with purpose, with intention. And they were walking perhaps wondering who rolled away the stone. Those men who had hated Jesus so much, amen, they were going to be so suspicious that someone would steal the body so that somehow falsely this Christian message could be, could be proven. And when they set this massive stone at the tomb, they sealed that, that tomb with that stone and then they stationed armed guards to fend off anybody that would come and try to take away the body of Jesus in the night. But when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary made it to the tomb, they themselves, and I want you to understand, were believers. They were believers with Ruth's faith. Amen. I'm preaching to other people in this building this morning that have been, and you are believers, but your faith has been bruised. And so these believers with bruised faith came to that tomb and they could not believe their eyes. What they saw was a stone rolled away and the guards were gone. The Bible talks about these women trying to process everything that's happened. When the angels came, when an angel came, the Bible talks about his attire. He meant sitting on that stone. And he spoke up two words that were probably not all that fitting at the moment because it was a frightening situation. But he said, fear not. Amen. That was quite an order. Quite an order because he came like lightning. That's what the scripture says. Would have been a startling moment, a startling scene. But he said, fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. 
But then the angel said, He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Amen. There are some really key words, and I believe those three are key words, as he said. And so he said, I'm not asking you now to take my word for it. I'm just asking you to come see the place where the Lord lay. You come see this place. Amen. The first evidence the angel gave them was the word of the Lord. He's not here as he said. Amen. As far as these two Marys knew, Jesus had always kept his word. Amen. I'm happy to have. I'm happy to announce today that I have people in my life who have always kept their word. Amen. We all have people in our lives. If they tell you something, you can kind of take it or leave it. But there are people that if they tell you something, you can, you can hook your star. Amen. You can hook your wagon rather to that star. They have never failed to tell the truth. Amen. And so they knew that Jesus had always kept his word. So they began to think back about what he said. Amen. He said that he was going to be betrayed. And he was. He said that he would be crucified, and he was. He said, I will be buried, and he was. But according to Matthew 17 and 23, he also told them, I'm going to raise from the grave. Amen. Like Jonah was three days in the belly of that well. Amen. So will the Son of Man. Hallelujah. Perhaps they remembered the outrage of the Jewish elite whenever Jesus said, You destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Amen. They were so off put by such a bold and what they deemed to be an arrogant statement. They were livid because their carnal minds could not comprehend the spiritual application. Amen. They understood that it took them 46 years to build a temple. And now Jesus is saying, if you destroy it, I'll do it again in three days. They missed the point altogether. He wasn't talking about their temple at all. Amen. Jesus wasn't talking about brick and mortar, but he was speaking about his body. You destroy this body, this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. And I want to tell you that Jesus always keeps his word. Amen. You can search the scriptures. You can begin in Genesis. And you can thread your way all the way through the book of Revelation. But you'll not find one place where Jesus ever broke one promise. And so I'll tell you this morning. I'm preaching to men and women that the Lord has made promises. And you have received those promises. You've seen them come to pass. But I'm also preaching to people this morning that you've got some promises that are still on hold. Some things that the Lord told you. Amen. I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to tell you that I'm in this line as well. I've got some promises the Lord has made me and God has been right there. Amen. He fulfilled those promises. He blew my mind on more than one occasion. But there's some other promises that the Lord has made me that have not come to pass dot, dot, dot yet. Amen. My faith is not weary. My strength has not grown, is not fading. My hope is not waning in Him. Amen. But I still wake up every day saying, Lord, this could be the day. Amen. I'm going to look with my eyes fixed firm on my tomorrow. My feet well planted in my todays. Because I know one thing about the Lord. He keeps His word. He keeps His word. Amen. You can't find a place where God won't keep His promises. The scripture is full of hundreds of promises that God made. And he has also full of promises that God has kept. I mentioned this again to you in passing. Amen. The only ones that have not come to pass are those that have not come to pass yet. Because the promise of God requires something else to go along with it. It It calls for the fullness of time. Amen. When the fullness of time had come, that's when Mary had Jesus in the, in, the, in the stable. Amen. There's a fullness of time that must come. And so many times God gives us a promise, but he doesn't, that promise doesn't come with a timeline. But I understand something, one thing about the promises of God, that they all come with the fullness of time. There are some promises God made me when I was a young man that had he given them to me right then, I would have abused them. I would have not understood their value. I would have had no way to measure their real worth. 
Hallelujah. But in the fullness of time, when God realized I was ready and I could handle that promise, he gave me that promise. I'm preaching to people that know what I'm talking about this morning. Praise the Lord. You find me any 10-year-old, most of them would want a set of keys to a new car. But that might not be in their best interest. And it certainly may not be in the public's best, best interest. But there's a promise. And when the fullness of time comes, God will be there. So the angel presented the words of Jesus to prove one powerful point. That Jesus was who he said he was. And he really did what he said he would do. Now just think about it. God's word was the first evidence that the angel gave these two ladies. But it was not the only evidence. The angel knew that they would want more proof. So he pointed to that empty tomb. And he said, he is not here for he is risen in verse number 6. And he said, come see the place. Amen. He is not here for he is risen as he said. I know that's a promise. He said, but I want you to move from where you are. Come on in. Amen. And you behold it with your own eyes. Amen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. For those who walk by faith, the words of Jesus should have been enough. I understand that. But aren't you thankful that he knows our weaknesses and our frailties? And at times when his word is not enough, he knows that we want more. Amen. They had been at the cross. We need to understand this. Amen. They had been at the cross. These two Marys, they had been at the cross. They watched their Savior brutally beaten and killed. They were there. This is not what they read in the paper. This is not what somebody told them down at the barbershop. This is not what they heard over breakfast. They were there. They watched the blood. And they watched the water that soaked the ground. They were standing there when the Roman guard pierced his side. Amen. They knew also that the Romans were skilled. And they knew what they were doing. Amen. To put it bluntly, the Roman guards were professional killers. Amen. These were not weaklings they hired for a day. This was not day labor that never held a spear in their hand. They were just moving at the whelm of their master. No, no. These Roman guards were trained professional killers. And so I will tell you that Jesus was professionally and publicly executed. Everyone who loved him lost him on Calvary. Amen. Everyone who knew him knew what they had seen and they with their own eyes watched him die. But in God's grace, amen, he showed them the empty tomb where he used to lay. He showed them the empty tomb where his body had been. Hallelujah. To show them that all the evidence of their broken hearts and everything that their eyes were longing to, to have, amen, could be fulfilled in a moment that Jesus really did rise from that grave. Amen. I'm telling you today that the tomb says it all. The tomb doesn't need me. The tomb doesn't need you. Amen. The tomb doesn't need anybody else to go say anything. The angel said if you want to prove that Jesus is who he says he is, just step in here and let this empty tomb in all of its silence, you let this empty tomb in all of its silence speak a message for the ages. And can I tell you the emptiness of that empty tomb is echoing all the way into 2023 on this April morning. The tomb says it all. It says it all. Amen. I know that we can sing about it and we should. And I think we ought to play our songs about it. Amen. As we should. We ought to teach on it, preach on it as we should. But at the end of the day, the tomb speaks for itself. They found nothing more than an empty tomb. The empty tomb was the one piece of the puzzle that the enemy could not put in place. Because if the tomb had not been empty, the guards could have marched into that tomb, pointed to the body of Jesus, boldly said, He is still there. And that would have crushed the rumor before it had spread past Jerusalem. But they could not because He was not there. He had risen just as He said He would. Even in Jesus' day, there were, there were theories. There's always been conspiracy theorists. That didn't just start with 9-11. That didn't just start with COVID-19. There's always been conspiracy theorists. 
I mean, you got a little quiet on that one. I'm not sure. And we got a little theorist among us. I'm not sure. Even so, I'm just going to act like it didn't happen. Keep on preaching. How's that? Amen. There's always been theories. And there were theories about the empty tomb trying to prove somehow or disprove perhaps somehow this message of Jesus. In our day, there are theories for why the women found an empty tomb. One theory would suggest that they just simply went to the wrong tomb. It's kind of weak, but that's a theory. It would have been easy to make that mistake according to some, but I would debate that because it was a visible tomb. It was a noticeable Roman seal because they had gone to great length to make sure that no one would mock or mimic what was going on here. And so if the women had gone to the wrong tomb, then perhaps there would have been no seal. Amen. And, and, and as soon as the story of the resurrection began to spread, then the guards who had been at that tomb would march right into that tomb, point to the body of Jesus, and again that story would be stopped in its tracks. And Christianity would have been over before it started. A second theory suggests that Jesus didn't die on the cross. That he only appeared to die. Three days in the cool confines of the grave would have given his body time to resuscitate. And so that's why on the third day he was able to garner enough strength, roll away the stone, sneak past the guards and walk out of the tomb alive. Amen. I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just sharing with you what some people have, have tried to believe. According to this theory, he was still alive because he never died. However, I want to go back to what I said a moment ago that the Roman soldiers were professional killers. This was not their first day on the job. They had crucified criminals before Jesus. They crucified criminals with Jesus, two thieves on the cross, and they would live to crucify criminals on the other side of the life of Jesus. And so since it was their custom to break the legs of the crucified, those that had been crucified, to hasten their death, and this is, this is a historical point of truth, amen, they broke the legs of the two men that were beside Jesus, but they did not break the legs of Jesus. This is in your Bible. One obvious reason would be because he was already dead. His body was already dead. Amen. However, we could just leave it at that, but there is a much deeper vein of truth. <laughs> Amen. That runs through this moment. They did not break his legs because if we go back to the book of Exodus, when God gave Moses and Aaron the rules for the Passover, one rule was the prohibition against breaking any of the bones in the lamb, amen, that was being sacrificed and eaten by the household. You could not break the bones of any lamb that was being offered. Amen. Why did God insist on this? Amen. I believe this command carries much symbolic weight. It carries a lot of symbolic weight. Because in John chapter 1 and verse number 29, John the Baptist, when Jesus was coming down the hillside to be baptized, when Jesus was coming to be baptized of John, amen, John said, behold, he just stopped everybody in their tracks of what they were doing. Amen. Behold, this is not just another baptismal service. This is not just another man coming to be baptized. When Jesus began to descend down that crest, amen, John said, Behold, which means turn aside and see the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And because Jesus was the Lamb of God, when the soldiers came to break the legs to hasten his death, amen, they found that he was already dead. It was a word of prophecy, amen, that you're not gonna break the legs of the Passover lamb, hallelujah. He is, he is that lamb. John 19 and 36 declares his truth about this moment. Amen. The Bible says in John 19 and 36, for these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Amen. He's going to give his life. You're not going to take his life. He's going to give his life, but he's going to take it back again. <laughs> my, my, my. You may embalm him, you may wrap him, you may put him in the tomb, and you may roll the stone, and you may seal the stone, but hear me, mankind. Amen. On the third day, like Jonah came out of that fish, 
I am coming out of this grave. Hallelujah. I am coming out of this grave. Amen. So I'll just remind you that the tomb says it all. The tomb says it all. The last detail of his death, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Verifying that he indeed was, as John the Baptist said, the sacrificial lamb. So to ensure he was dead, one of the, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. He was acting as though he were that professional murderer. His legs are not broken. He is dead. But I will make one last attempt to make sure. Amen. And so with his spear, he pierced the side of Jesus Christ. I understand this is a very gory story. But there's so much truth woven into this story. The Bible says that when he pierced his side, forthwith came blood and water. And there is so much spiritual significance to this. Amen. Blood came forth because blood is for redemption. It is to deal with sins. It is the purchasing of the church. Don't ever stop talking about the blood. Don't ever stop singing about the blood. Amen. Don't ever pr- stop praying about the blood. Don't ever stop pleading the blood. Amen. It is the bloodline. Praise God. I, I, I don't want to meander too far this morning, but I'm going to tell you in Exodus when the death angel was coming by. Amen. They said you need to apply the blood to your doorpost. To the, amen. And when the death angel comes by, when he sees the blood, he will pass over. I know I've said it and other ministers in our church have said it in recent times. But I want to tell you that in 2023, the reason, amen, one of the reasons that the Lord has not come back for his bride is because there is a church that is pleading the blood. Amen. There is a church. There is a bloodline. Hallelujah. I'm thankful this morning for intercessors. I'm thankful those in the house of God. Amen. But those also that are in the body of God that are pleading the blood. Amen. I'm preaching to some some folks here this morning that know what I'm talking about. Amen. I plead the blood over those situations. That blood is for redemption. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 23 said, and verse 22 rather, and almost all things are by law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. In the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Amen. He said, feed the church of God. And here's why. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. I am so thankful today for the blood. The blood and the water that came out of the side of our Messiah show us two important aspects of the Lord's death. Amen. There is the redemptive aspect of the blood. Amen. But then there is the life imparting aspect, and that is the water. I'm thankful that I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The Bible says that we have remission of sin through the blood. Hallelujah. That removal of sin. I'm thankful for the blood that washes us and cleanses us. But I'm also thankful for the water. That water of baptism. Amen. Baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of our sins. That's what the book of Acts says. Amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Amen. Gives us the plan of salvation. That we would repent of our sins. That we would change our mind not just for a moment but we would change our mind change our ways change our direction amen that we would repent of our sins and be water baptized in his precious name and when we take in water baptism in his name we take on the blood are you hearing me today the blood is applied I'm I'm so thankful today for the water and for the blood praise God I'm thankful that his blood is fitting to remove and to remit our sins I'm thankful today that it puts it as far as the east is from the west it is, it is hard if not almost impossible for us to comprehend that the Lord can forget because we have such trouble forgetting what we should we struggle remembering some things but we struggle forgetting some things that we should amen I'm thankful for the blood and the water separates out Amen. A third theory 
was the first theory of the Jewish leaders thought of. They said someone has stolen the body. That's what's wrong. This theory suggests that one or more people broke into the tomb, stole the body of Jesus without the guards, trained professionals, seeing them or stopping them. But the guards were on high alert, especially on this third day, because they already heard. They knew. I think there have been a few tag-in meetings about this. Remember, remember, that third day, that third day, they knew that there had been a threat. And they knew the location and they knew the day. And so I believe on that third day, if anyone had come even close to that tomb, those guards would have caught them and killed them on the spot. The Romans held very little value for human life, that they, especially that they thought threatened their purpose or their rule. And so they would have thought nothing about taking one more life. These were the same disciples that ran for their lives when Jesus was arrested. I mean, they thought nothing about taking their life. It is unlikely that they would have run to the tomb to risk their lives for a lie if they ran from Calvary. There was no threat. There was no real threat. Amen. Even more unlikely, all of them would have laid down their lives if the resurrection was all a lie. They, they wouldn't have risked their lives. They're trying to put their minds all back together. But there is a truth to what we're talking about today. The tomb says it all. I'm going to ask our musicians to come if they will. After Mary and her friends saw the empty tomb, they ran. They ran at the commission and command of the angel. He said, go tell the disciples. Go tell them. They ran to tell the disciples. And I will be honest with you, it was the news they were anxious to hear, wanting to hear. Because their faith was so woefully bruised. I, I believe that I'm speaking to people today that have had to deal with some measure of disappointment in life. Maybe someone, something, perhaps a person, an entity, or maybe larger than that disappointed you I'm not, I'm not talking about somebody being seven minutes late for lunch but real disappointment the place where you were leaning that you thought would never move moved the thing you were trusting failed we've all been disappointed in our lives all of us. And their faith was in a pretty weak spot. If It's hard for us sometimes we move so quickly through the word of God to get to the promises. Sometimes it's hard for us to back up and put ourselves frame by frame by frame in their world in that moment. Again, they had seen him beaten pierced, crucified. They heard him cry out. They saw him draw his last breath. They watched him wrapped, placed in a tomb. They watched it sealed and a stone rolled and several armed guards. And these were not weak people. but It was unsurmountable circumstances. So, so Simon, Peter, and John... When they heard the word, when these two Marys come back and Mary Magdalene and her friend Mary, when they, when they came and they gave the story of what the angel said, the Bible talks about Simon, Peter, and John, and they ran, they ran to the tomb. They ran to the tomb where they knew Jesus would be there. And when they got there, John in his humanity, just stood staring at a stone rolled away. But Simon Peter, you can always count on Simon Peter. 
He's a two-mile man in a one-mile world. <laughs> John, you may have paused, but excuse me, sir. I got to see this for myself. And Peter went inside and looked around. Amen. There were the clothes, but there was no body. It was the right tomb, and Jesus was not there. The tomb was empty, and it could only mean one thing. Jesus was alive and well. If we, if we could just stop this scene right here. They had no way of knowing where to from here. Where, what do we do now? But they knew one thing, that their Savior was alive. And so that empty tomb says it all. That empty tomb to the scientist says, explain this. That empty tomb to history says, repeat this. That empty tomb to time says, erase this. It can't be done. You can't explain it. You can't repeat it. And you can't erase it. Because empty tombs speak for themselves. They are what they are. Amen. I don't want to... I'm going to mention something. I don't want to be here on this day. But when the rapture of the church, when the church is called away, there's a lot of people in this world that don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in the Lord. They don't believe any of, any of the things that's between those blessed pages. It's the harsh truth, but it is the truth. But I will promise you, I don't know what it's going to look like. I mean... We've all envisioned and imagined what graveyards are going to look like that hold the saints of God. I don't know if the Lord's just going to rapture the spirit out or if it's going to come out and blow the lid of that vault off and dirt's going to be scattered everywhere. I don't know. I don't know. But let's just assume that. Let's assume that there's going to be some visible sign that the church has been called home. When someone walks to the grave of their grandmother, that blessed person that lived for God and gave their all, and they look at that empty vault, they're not going to need a preacher. They won't need a PA system. They won't need a microphone. They won't need a piano player, a drummer, a bass player. They're not going to need anybody humming Amazing Grace in the background. Because that silent, empty vault is going to say everything that needs to be said. It was real. Except in that moment, it will be too late. Amen. There is a dispensation called grace. Luke 4. Jesus took the Bible, the Word. I know I've said this in recent service, in a recent service, but He took the Bible from the hands of the disciples. And He began to read from the book of Isaiah. And then the scripture says, and I think this is so important for us to understand. Because in your daily Bible reading, you could just blow right past this powerful truth. But when he finished reading, he closed the book. And he handed the book back to the disciples. So if I could just put this in a different way. Jesus put the book, this book of truth, this plan of salvation in the hands of the ministry. It's in my hand today. But when he comes back, he's coming back to take this book out of the hands of the ministry. Because he's going to judge the earth. He's going to judge the world out of this same book. And when he comes back, the dispensation of grace is going to end and the dispensation of judgment is going to begin. What I'm telling you this morning is this, ladies and gentlemen. It was a powerful thing to stand at that empty tomb and let it say everything. But it's going to be a dreadful thing to stand at any other empty tomb. Amen. We've got grace on our side today. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Our world can be a chaotic place. Trials will... Trials of life, tests of life will pull at the very fabric of our faith. Just, just so that just so that others 
may feel a little measure of consolation, I'm going to ask everybody in this building to be honest with me for just one moment. And if you're not ashamed to admit that there have been times that your faith has had its fabric pulled to the point that life made no sense, would, would you just raise your hand here today? Amen. Look around. Look around this house. See, this is not a house filled with supermen, superwomen. This is not a house filled with, with superheroes that have never had a bad day, that have never had a rainy day. But we have all been just like Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. We have walked through life with heavy hearts. They brought spices not to heal him. They didn't bring spices to resurrect him. They brought spices to stave off the stench for just a few more days because everything they believed was all gone. Amen. That's how they came. Sometimes that's how we come. But the angel said, come here and let me let you see something. And there may be times that we wonder if God hears us, if God can help us. And for every one of those times when you think you're about to lose your faith, I'm just going to ask you to take a long look into that empty tomb. Amen. He's not there. <laughs> the empty tomb is empty because He has risen just like He said He would. <clears throat> and if He fulfilled that promise, He'll fulfill the promises He made to you and I. Amen. Can I tell you today that Jesus Christ died not so that we could have an Easter service. He rose again not so we could have an Easter resurrection Sunday service. He was born and He lived and He died and He rose again so that you and I could be filled with His Spirit. When He was on the cross, the Bible says, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two. What that means, if I could just put it very simply, that prior to this, man, common man, had no access to God. You had to depend on somebody else to touch God on, on, on your behalf. But I will tell you today that because he went to the grave and came out of that grave, amen, <laughs> amen, he said, I'm going to go away, but when I come back, I'm going to receive it to myself. Amen, I'm going away. I got to go away because I want to come in you. I don't want to just dwell with you. I want to dwell in you. Amen, that is what we call the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You can have that today. That's your promise. You can have it today. You can repent of your sins. You can be baptized in His name for the remission, the removal of, of those sins. And you can be filled with His Spirit. Amen. That's not just for a few people. That's not for those that were just there in Jerusalem. It's not just for those in Acts 2. Amen. It's whosoever will. Them that are afar off. As many as our Lord, the Lord our God shall call. Amen. That includes you and I today. I'm so thankful that I have the privilege to know Him. This morning, don't leave here without Him. Don't leave here without Him touching your heart and your life the way He wants to. Can we magnify the Lord together in this house right now? We're just going to entertain the Spirit, the presence of the Lord.